But take us through that a little bit, you know, looking back um, at, at 25 years on the air here. Um, what have you seen sort of change? What about you has evolved? Your, you know, your on-air um, persona, your, you know, your interviewing skills. What, 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 do you, what do you look back and what, what sticks out? Well, one thing that's so different is the media landscape in general. And if my goal from the start was to do a very interactive radio show, then the media has just evolved into this, you know, huge uh, Christmas present for me uh, because interactivity has exploded so many more avenues for interactivity. You know, we talk about interactivity today like it's a defining force and everything is interactive. So, you know, social media, well, in the early earliest days of the show, it was pre-internet, and I was an early user, kind of an early adopter of computers and online networks, so I was in that old, that some people remember from the 80s, The Well, which was kind of an online community that divided up into different chat rooms depending on what topics you were interested in. Um, I was doing online um, research for the show on the old service called CompuServe, which had, you know, for pay each step of the way, what they called a magazine database and a newspaper database. Then a few years later, as it was getting closer to what we think of as the internet, and there were um, what they called bulletin boards, where people could post, um, just post messages and respond to each other, you know, mm -hmm. um, the precursor of the current comments page. I made sure that we set up a bulletin board right away that was attached to the show. So then all of a sudden we had, you know, an in-print adjunct to our, our on-air presence every day. That was 24-7 in, you know, 1993 or whatever that was. That was this sort of new, exciting adventure and in interactivity. Uh, we did learn early on that the people who tend to post on those things tend to be those 10 most opinionated people mm -hmm. on everything, and the people who hate you are going to go on uh, the most quickly. That's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Because I also, you know, I'm pretty into the, the wisdom of the crowd as a concept, and I think that there's a lot of self-correction that takes place. And so people, even back then, would push back against um, the simple-minded bashers and say, hey, come on, let's have a level of discourse here. Uh, you know, express your opinion, but let's let's make this a meaningful space. And I didn't have to go in as a cop and do it. You know, other users were doing it. Mm -hmm. So then, eventually, more elements of the modern internet, and then social media. And so now we have a Twitter presence, we have a Facebook presence, we use Instagram sometimes. You know, so our interactivity might be photo projects, video contests, um, and all kinds of things. But I was starting with that core interest anyway. Uh, so the changes in the media, I think, have really played into um, opportunities for growth for our show. So that's one of the big, mm. one of the biggest changes that I think is. How about your style? Do you feel like you've changed over time? Do you feel like you're 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 very similar to sort of how you first went on air? Uh, what what have you noticed well, in I'm yourself? Probably, you know, probably my core is very <laughs> similar to when we first went on air, uh, but I've certainly gotten better at it. You know, and I've gotten smarter and wiser, and I just know a lot more mm -hmm. uh, from having this much experience looking at the big ongoing issues that we talk about all, all the time in the city. For example, you know, take your pick, education, crime, whatever it is. You know, and my interactions with people have become probably more subtle, um, you know, so I've developed uh, probably just more skill in being able to have a good conversation with a caller, um, knowing from experience how to react to different kinds of situations, certainly writing questions or spontaneously asking questions of newsmakers and guests. Uh, you know, like, if you want to do sort of a tough interview with somebody, there's a way to do it where you're challenging them, but you're still getting them to open up. Or there's a way you can do it where right away they think you're hostile and they shut themselves down. No, I've gotten better at doing the former rather than the latter mm -hmm. over time. And um, nobody ever walked out of an interview, but deciding that the way that they were going to defend themselves was to attack me. And that, that doesn't really happen anymore, but I don't think I'm being any yes. less. I'm not shrinking from asking them the tough questions. Mm -hmm. I think it's a question of how and that that's come with experience. 
what do you, can you tell when someone walks into your studio when you know you can sense or you know ahead of time this is going to be a little bit of a tougher interview or maybe it's over the phone that might be a little harder to tell but can you sort of tell early how it might go I think not so much in the way that I think you mean it like um, from somebody's body language or from their face that this is going to be a tough interview if you're talking about a newsmaker kind of interview I know before I go in the room because I'm going to generate that it's going to be a tough interview. I think I really have to challenge somebody on something um, and that they may not like it when we get to that point. But it's not like somebody walks in and, oh, they're going to be, I see, oh, they have a surly look on their face, so this is going to be tough. Not usually like that. You get a guest who isn't as talkative as you'd like them to be on, on air. I'm always curious sort of, you know, how you, how you handle that. And I, you know, sometimes the, you know, oh, I don't know, tell me how you feel about sort of, uh, it seems to me, I'm not a radio expert, that sort of dead air is not a good thing, although a pause here and there can be, can be valuable. I'd say you don't have to be a radio expert <laughs> to determine that dead air mm -hmm. is not a good yeah, thing. Yeah, the guest, you know, and it happens. Some people are great writers and lousy talkers. So we certainly have had examples over the years. I'm not thinking of any name right now. Nothing's coming right now. I mind. won't ask you but for any names. <laughs> but it'll happen where somebody maybe has written a great book, and then they come on and they give you three-word answers. Sometimes they've even been trained with media training because when they do the same book, on, book interview on CNN or something, they're going to talk in 20-second sound bites or they're going to get one answer in and be dismissed. So... Either way, if they're talking too short, then there are a few things I can do. One is that I talk more, <laughs> you know, and if I know the material, I can, sometimes I wind up on rare occasions articulating their material better than they do, either because they're not as clear in speaking as they are in writing um, or because they're just not getting it out somehow, being really short, as you said. So that's one way. Another way is to make sure that I'm asking descriptive questions, questions that draw descriptive answers. You know, when, when I work with younger producers, one of the things that we train people on is not to write a lot of yes or no questions. If you want a yes or no answer, write a yes or no question. If you want somebody to talk about something, ask how, ask why, ask where something came from, uh, that kind of thing. And so, you know, some people you don't have to stick to that so strictly. I can sort of ask a yes or no question because it obviously sets up the kind of response that I'm looking for. Or sometimes you don't have to ask a question at all. You know, sometimes it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. And the conversation develops where I can make a statement that's my own reaction to something that they're doing. And just like you would do if you're out to dinner with a friend, you know, you're not interviewing your friend, you're having a conversation. And actually, that's a sweet spot. When we hit those interviews, you know, those are, those are up there. When it really just becomes a conversation that the listeners are listening in on, and that notion of interviewer and interviewee falls away a little bit, so with people who, who I know I have a rapport with or spontaneously discover I have a rapport with or who are just really good interview subjects because they're experienced or they're good at it, um, those rules don't have to apply mm -hmm. as strictly. But for somebody who's a short talker and an articulate talker, then one of the, the techniques is to fall back on questions that set them up for a little more expansive mm -hmm. response.